I believe every one of us sitting here at some point of life would have been fascinated by the night sky. The stars that we see in the night, the amount of planets and the research that goes on, the galaxies out there, everyone is fascinated about that, right? According to United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, today we humans have launched around 8,000 man-made objects in the outer space. United Nations Office for Outer Space uh, Outer Affairs is an organization which deals with maintaining international space laws, also having a register of a number of objects that as humans we launch in the outer space. The first space mission that we have launched as humans was in 1942, which was a German V-2 missile. And from then to today, in 2018, in the last so many years, the whole space program globally has evolved a lot. We have multiple organizations independently doing space research. Even the countries are supporting them, right? Talking about NASA, ISRO, the ESA, the European Space Agencies, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Russian have their own space program. The evolution is too much. We are very rapidly growing in this sector. But we have few concerning facts here also. Out of all the 8,000 satellites that we have launched since 1942 till 2018, 1 16th of all of these got launched in last one year. In 2017 alone, we have launched around 453 of these satellites. This year, in less than two months' time, we have launched around 53 objects in the outer space. Why we are launching so many objects so rapidly? What is leading us to do that? It's actually the space, a small technology area in the space technologies that is the development of nanosats and the cubesats. Okay? These satellites are very small in size. The time required to build and design these satellites is less. It is less expensive also. And also, the lot of commercial providers coming out today who are building this. Um, uh, most of you might be aware about a CubeSat. CubeSat is just a 1 kg satellite, or less than 1 kg sometimes, and it is only having a dimension of 10 cubic centimeters. It's so small, but it has powerful uh, use cases. The payloads that goes on a CubeSat is similar to the payloads that goes on a large-scale satellite 10 years back. But according to another union, it's a union of concerned scientists globally, out of all these 8,000, over 8,000 space objects that we have launched, only 37% of them are operational. What happens to the rest of the objects that we have launched? We don't collect it back. It's there in the outer space. And we call it space debris. Today we are concerned about a lot of things related to pollution. We are concerned about air pollution, the soil pollution. We are also concerned about the water pollution and the global warming, everything that's happening within the planet. But we humans are not only spoiling the planet alone, we are also trying to spoil our galaxy and the calm and the peace, peaceful space outside. Remaining of these eight, over 5,000 debris that we have, they're actually just junk piece of metal hurtling around in the universe at a high, very high speed. They're actually hurting at a, hurtling around at a speed of 67 kilometers per second but today. The concern about space pollution is a real concern. To give you some facts, according to a lot of research organizations and independent researchers being conducted, we have around 20,000 pieces of space debris over the size of a softball and around half a million space debris the size of a marble. And scientists also claim there are millions of other space debris out there varying a size between 2 mm and 20 centimeters. Problem with space pollution is not only restricted to the things that we do in the outer space. Of course, outer space, a space debris can make a complete operational orbit non-operational. We have a, when we are uh, doing our future missions, if it involves human, it is an actual life threat. Just imagine something, what can happen, what, uh, something similar to what has happened 65 million years ago. 65 million years ago, Earth got hit by an asteroid. And that led to extinction of a complete species. If you can guess it, it was the dinosaurs. Right? Today, 
Space debris can have certain threats similar to these. It cannot be of such a large scale that all humans get extinct, but the space debris that we're talking about, the larger junk sizes, when they are within the orbit, they can stay there for a very long time. But if they start moving towards Earth, if they get deorbited, they do so in a very uncontrolled manner. And if they're smaller in size, they vaporize up there. But if they're not, they can actually come and hit maybe a city or a village. And it can be a life-threatening. Uh, current research in this area is quite rapid. A lot of research is happening in this area to avoid space debris and tackle this problem. But they're all theories. We have some uh, theories in terms of having uh, RFID-based nets in the space. Chin uh, Chinese people actually literally launched a net in the space to collect debris. They failed. We also have some theories of having autonomous small-scale uh, satellite swarms, which can do that, or robotic arms in space, which can go and collect the debris. So we have a couple of Indian researchers who are suggesting to have probes which can deorbit this and vaporize them up before it uh, enters our troposphere. A lot of theories are there, but they're all in theories. Nothing practically has been implemented yet. So idea here is not completely against the technology and the science behind orbital satellites, but a lot of things that what these orbital satellites are doing today can be done in a different space altogether. We have a very untouched space within our planet, which is at a height of 10 to 50 kilometers above us, that is from the troposphere, between the troposphere and the ionosphere in the layers. We call it the stratosphere. Today, most of the research that we do with these small scale satellites and these orbital satellites, around 70 to 80 percent of that research can be done with only stratospheric satellites. Why are we talking about this new area of satellites? Stratospheric satellites are having a lot of advantages. One is the mission cost, the time to go live. The, the time to go live for this mission is quite less. And also, this whole technology and the whole hardware that we use for these satellites are reusable. They don't stay in, up there. They're not junk. They, they have a flight time between a couple of hours to a couple of weeks. And you can actually recover them. They descend with a parachute after a couple of weeks, and you can reuse them. As a space, as a technology, stratosphere is not very new. The Met Department, the Meteorological Department, launches a balloon, a high-altitude balloon, on a daily basis. The nearest Met Department from the Velour and Chennai Road, they launch two balloons on a daily basis. They're doing it. But commercialization of this sector has not happened yet. That is something that we are thinking in next one decade of research will be moving from orbital satellites to the stratospheric satellites. And what we are planning to do in stratosphere on our planet Earth can be done in other planets also. The future Mars missions can have high altitude ballooning's within their atmosphere, and they can do a lot of research in a very economical manner. They don't have to launch. So tomorrow, we have a human establishment in Mars that we are planning in next two decades. We don't have to have like a constellation of orbital satellites that we send to Mars. That amount of time it takes, it's too high, right? But these high altitude ballooning's can actually solve that. But it's not the advantages that we have to look at it. Everything has some kind of a challenges when we have to start implementing something new. The major challenge with stratospheric satellites today is the flight time. Orbital satellites, when you uh, launch them in a lower, uh, lower Earth orbit or a mid-orbit, they can last for a quarter a century. They can last for up to like 25, 30 years. But that is not the case with stratospheric satellites. Stratospheric satellites today have a maximum lifespan of a couple of weeks. Max to max six weeks, that is something that we have achieved. But a lot of research is happening in this area. Bigger organizations, bigger corporations are doing a lot of research. This whole domain is a huge domain. We have to uh, consider one thing. When we're talking about these huge domains and you want to do something in these domains, we have to find a niche in this. Like any other startup, like any other industry, if you want to do something good, you want to do something valuable, you have to find a niche area in that domain. And that 
niche area is important even in space technology. Space technology as a domain has different verticals. It is not just the rocket building or the satellites we talk about. It can be as simple as the food tech, right? What do the astronauts eat in next one decade? There's Indian startup which is planning to build, uh, which is uh, planning to send Khichri to the Indian ast astronauts who are getting launched in next five years. They want to send rasam and rice to the astronauts who are going to the moon in next five years, right? There's Indian startup working only in the food tech space. So as a domain, it's a big domain. But we have to believe in this thing. If you want to pursue your career in this kind of a domain, or create solutions, create products in this kind of a domain, it is different from the conventional IT domain or education or those kind of things. In IT, you can actually build a product in three months or six months and go live. But it's not the same case here. Here, your product building itself can take half a decade. Your research itself can take a decade. You have to have that kind of a time frame. You have to give that kind of a time frame for your research to grow. The government support is important for all these things. The government can support in multiple manner. Today, for launching one of the smallest uh, applications of a high altitude ballooning or a stratospheric sat, you just need a bit, uh, piece, few pieces of electronics, a soda can, and a helium balloon. Right? All these things are easily accessible. You can build a satellite of your own, maybe within a week. Just on the, over a weekend, you can build a satellite today. But launching that satellite is not easy. The compliances and the permissions that you need from the government to launch this is quite tedious work. You need permission from the local police station, from the local airport authority, local military base, the med department. If ISRO has a local office, you have to go there, you have to go to the PwC. There's a few of the permissions. Also, to use GPS or RF communication, you need a special license for that. So all those things are something which government can ease out, and they are working on it. We don't have any regulatory uh, approach to this yet, because we don't have much of startups in India working in this domain. It's just a handful, and they're all in a very early stage, even like us. Other than this, government support also comes in the form of grants. The kind of domain that we are working in, the talking about, the space technology, it needs uh, the amount of money that goes in in the research is high. The government grants are significant source of income. Not only grants, the government contract projects that we get. They're significant source of incomes for all these things. Two, keeping uh, in mind all these facts, the investment scenario in current seen in last couple of months has been good. If you are planning to do something in this sector, you want to planning a, uh, build a startup in this sector, the investment scenario is quite good. Why? Because in the West, we have a couple of successful startups, successful space technology startups. Depending on that, the whole VC uh, uh, mindset is actually changing. They're actually planning to pump in more money in this sector. So it's a good time if you want to start something in the space tech. Keeping all these things aside, we should not go away from the undeniable fact that making money from outer space is difficult. It's not easy. You have to have the time. You have to give the time that it needs. You have to be patient. And also, you have to have a vision. The path you take in this domain is difficult, but having a vision is very important. Having a vision is important not only for the space technology stuff, it is important whatever you want to do in your life. Vision is something which is defined at a very different stages of life for different people. Few people have their vision of life maybe at a very early age. Few don't even have till they die. It took me 14 years to get a vision of my life, what I wanted to do. I was 14 years old when I got introduced to the world of technology. It was an interesting story. I was just walking one afternoon with my uncle in one of the streets in Kolkata. I'm based out of Kolkata. It's called College Street. It's one of the famous streets where you get these books, when you want to buy books. And at that age, uh, when I was walking, I got uh, one roadside vendor. He was selling some books about constellations. He was selling some books about programming and stuff. I just asked my uncle, can I get those? And he actually bought me those books. There are a lot of turning points that we get in our life. Okay? These turning points brings us a lot of opportunities. What I'm doing today is actually a funny story. 
It was because of, in 2014, NASA conducts the International Space Challenge, and surprisingly, that year, they were doing it for the first time in India, and that's so in a city where I was studying, that was Bangalore. And I happened to participate in that, and I was the only student who was participating in the challenge. I met one of my other friends who was a researcher at CIS, his name is Sharath. And we both worked on a project. We call it the Quora. Quora stands for Coastal Quake Alert Response and Analytics. It is a deep learning based system which can predict earthquakes two weeks before it happens. At present, it has an accuracy of 62%. We have predicted an earthquake in 2014. In April 19, the earthquake happened. It was in Child, South America. The actual Richter scale was 8.4. We predicted a week back it was this earthquake going to happen there for 7.8. Okay, it's an open source project. Any one of you can contribute to that. We have around 120 contributors, and from that project, NASA started recognizing us, and we were the winners of the NASA's International Space Challenge that year. So turning points are very important in life. That was one of the turning points in my life. I come from a middle class family. We don't have enough funds to actually spend on ideas. But that challenge gave me a winning amount of $20,000. And I used that money from an uh, organization called OpenCube Labs. OpenCube Labs, we don't run it as a private organization. It is more of a technology community, where our main vision is to empower students and come in the field of space technology, how they can pursue space technology as a career. Technology communities play a major role if you want to do something in the technology field. A lot of people think that technology communities are run by amateur hobbyists, but that's not always true. Technology communities can be a critical source of mentoring or your resources that you need when you are doing some kind of a work. With that in mind, just have a vision. You don't have to panic yourself if you don't have a vision at present, but you will get it sometimes. But don't miss out on opportunities. Always value your turning points. Thank you.